The year is 1950. Senator Joseph McCarthy gains power. The Korean War begins. Charles Schultz first publishes the Peanuts comic strip. And the director of special projects for the State of Eternity would rent a warehouse about a mile from the White House. What, that last one doesn't sound familiar to you? Well, the director of special projects for the State of Eternity would spend the next 14 years working on one of the most remarkable artworks I've ever seen. And he died before it was ever completed. But this piece, quite possibly the only piece of art he ever made, would end up in the Smithsonian. Still doesn't sound familiar? Well, let's talk about it. Art lovers, my name is Christopher West, and this channel is dedicated to my passion for modern and contemporary art and design. And today I want to talk about James Hampton, AKA the Director of Special Projects for the State of Eternity. And I'm not going to beat around the bush here and try to build suspense. I'm gonna get right to it. Let's face it, if you were the Director of Special Projects for the State of Eternity, and you were only gonna make one artwork in your life, it would probably be this. And its title is as spectacular as the silver and gold aluminum foil that adorns it. It's called the Throne of the Third Heaven of the Nation's Millennium General Assembly. And I could potentially end this video right here. I mean, all you have to do is look at it, learn the title, and you begin to understand that no other artwork on the planet can compete with this. But once you realize this was one man's obsession, his life work, a project he would work on for more than 14 years without really showing it to anyone, it becomes obvious it's worth a bit of a deeper dive. And it wasn't until 1964, after his death, that the public even became aware that this piece existed. And that's probably because Hampton never thought of this as a piece of art, at least not in the way we commonly think of art. The throne, as it's often called, was a monument to Jesus and Washington. And although I admire his perseverance and dedication, he might have had some, let's just say, interesting visions that led to the creation of the throne. Hampton claimed that God visited him often, that he met Moses in 1931, the Virgin Mary in 1946, and in 1949, on the day of President Truman's inauguration, Adam appeared to him. I might have gotten that wrong. I bet he meant Adam of Adam and Eve fame. So clearly, after you meet the first man ever created, the guy who parted the Red Sea, the virgin who would give birth to a Messiah, you're probably thinking that Jesus Christ could come knocking on your door any day now, so you better get to work. Now, personally, I might have vacuumed or cleaned the bathroom a little better, but Hampton decided to build a monument. His day job, Actually, his night job was working as a janitor for the General Services Administration. And when he finished work, he would walk to the workshop and collect old furniture, vases, light bulbs, cigarette packaging. This detritus would be incorporated into his creation and then meticulously covered in silver and gold foil. 180 pieces in all, with one side dedicated to the Old Testament and the other to the New Testament. The centerpiece was a cushioned chair, crowned with the words, Fear Not. But this wasn't a chair for you and me. We don't know much about Hampton's life, and it appears that he spent much of his adulthood as a recluse. We do know of one woman, possibly a love interest, whom Hampton shared his work with. She said no one could sit on the throne, but he would permit you to approach it on your knees. And we know he approached a couple of churches to donate the piece to become a place of study. None were interested. And Hampton wasn't just building this visual masterpiece, he was writing about it. He kept a 108-page notebook titled St. James, the Book of the Seven Dispensation. So perhaps this might give us a little bit more insight. But there's just one problem. Most of the text was written in a completely unknown script that is now known as Hamptonese, and many have tried unsuccessfully to decipher it. Mark Stamp, a computer scientist who may have come the closest, ultimately published a paper saying Hamptonese may be the written equivalent of speaking in tongues. 
So aside from these visions, where did the inspiration for the throne come from? His absentee father was also a Baptist minister, and although his father seemed to have left him and his siblings at age six, it's thought that the Southern Baptist teachings likely influenced him at an early age. He also spent time in the army, stationed in the Pacific, and some of the imagery in the throne appears, at least in spirit, to have been influenced by Pacific Island culture. We'll likely never know, and we probably wouldn't even be having this discussion if it wasn't for his landlord, Meyer Wertlieb. For 14 years, Hampton had faithfully been paying Wertlieb 50 bucks a month to rent the workshop. And when suddenly those payments stopped, Wertlieb learned that Hampton had recently passed away from cancer at the Veterans Hospital in Washington. He went to clear out the workshop to prepare for another tenant, and this was the first time he saw the throne of the third heaven of the nation's Millennium General Assembly. And I think this is a good time to thank Mr. Wertlieb. I've been to some of those storage unit auctions and I've worked with families after they've had a loved one pass away. And often what's left over is stuff that's not treated with a lot of respect. The fact that Wertlieb recognized that he had found something special and then took the next steps to preserve it is pretty remarkable. But Wertlieb wasn't an art dealer or an expert, and it seems he really didn't have a need for a throne that awaited the second coming of Jesus Christ. Presumably, he may have already had one in his home. So he contacted Hampton's family, and when his sister came to DC to claim the body, she refused to take the artwork. And although he needed to clean the space to get ready for the next tenant, he would tell a reporter at the Washington Post, you can't just destroy something a man devoted himself to for 14 years. So he did what he could, and he put an ad in the newspaper, an actual print newspaper that people used to read and respond to. And in a possibly ironic twist, this altarpiece, this throne built for Jesus Christ that had been rejected by religious institutions would become embraced by the art world. Ed Kelly, a local sculptor, responded to the ad. And when he went to investigate this potential studio space, he opened the door and was blown away. Kelly then contacted local curator Alice Denny, who in turn brought some of the biggest players in the 20th century art world to see the artwork. There were two very important dealers from New York, Ivan Karp and Leo Castelli, as well as the artist Robert Rauschenberg. Ultimately, the back rent would be paid, and in 1970, the throne went on permanent display at the Smithsonian. And I just saw the throne of the Third Millennium Nation's General Assembly for the first time a couple years ago. And it's the type of piece that once you see it, you can't forget it. And I can't say that about many other artworks I've seen in museums. There's Picasso's Guernica and Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Is it fair to compare the throne with the Sistine Chapel? I don't know. But both works were created to remind us of a spiritual realm. But I can't help to think, should Jesus ever return to this earth, he would rather hang out in a garage with James Hampton. That's it for today, folks. If you made it this far, you're a rock star, and I really appreciate you watching. Please take a moment to give this the big thumbs up. And if you enjoyed this content at all, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. As always, feel free to reach out to me in the comments or send me an email. I'll put all my information in the description below. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Ciao!